The Dice Tower, Episode 588, Last Minute Packing. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by USAopoly. Share laughter and make memories. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Mandy and I are getting ready for the Dice Tower Cruise while we talk some board game apps, magic seeds, and buried treasure, and we'll answer a few questions from the mailbox. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And boy, oh boy, Mandy, I am so glad that we are actually managing to record this episode. I actually think this is a good time to to give kind of a public thank you to our wonderful editor, who people may not realize you know, has such a big role in making our show happen is Jeff, uh, who edits all our shows. And we have to record this way later than we normally would, because out here in Seattle, we've had massive windstorms and I've had power outages that prevented us from recording normally. So poor Jeff, thank you so much for (laughs) taking this last minute edit and making it happen. We appreciate you so much. Yes, we totally do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And meanwhile, then you're cranking away. I know you're working on your top 100. Yeah, just so you all know, I am interrupting my top 100 work, you know, working away to record this. I can't even say that I'm upset about it, actually, because it's just, oh, my goodness, I needed a break. It's so much like I'm I'm happy to get it out, but I want it to be perfect. So have a little break and we'll get back at her. There you go. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing your top 100 board games, Mandy, because I, I can guess some of them, but 100's a lot. So I'm, I'm curious what's kind of going to be in the gaps that are that are unexpected. Oh, it should be, it should be interesting. And I always tell people, don't judge me. And I'm like, no, we won't judge you. I'm like, you're lying. (laughs) Oh, they're so going to judge you. I'm so going to judge you. Oh, no. (laughs) Well, and then we are cranking this out. And I know you're trying to get that top 100 done because we are going to Florida soon to jump on a big old boat with a bunch of awesome people to play a bunch of awesome games. Mm-hmm, on the excited. Dice Tower Cruise. It's going to be so fun. I mean, it's an incredible privilege to be able to do something like this. Uh, we, You and I have gone once before, right? Mm-hmm. And had a really good time. I don't know what this exactly means, but apparently I'm supposed to pack, oh, an animal onesie. <laughs> There's something about <laughs> Facebook, and it's got to happen, and so... I'm packing a onesie. Yeah, I also think Eric will be packing a onesie. I'm packing a onesie. Actually, I'm packing a couple onesies, but gotta have a spare. Yeah, so we could we can thank Jeff for this. Actually, oh. I think he is the one that has started the movement, the onesie movement or Kigurumi movement, however you'd like to say it. This is gonna be so board games in fuzzy onesies on a ship in the tropics. This is gonna be interesting already. It's gonna be hot. I mean, it's it's going to be amazing, and you know, you kind of get cut off. They they bring a great library on board, and it's really just pretty much open gaming. There's not a lot of scheduled events. I mean, there's individual scheduled games, but it's pretty much just people coming on a boat. Some people doing boat thingies. Other people yeah. like me uh, just playing games. I don't know. I I don't even know if I'm going to get off the boat. No, no, we have to get off this time. Okay, for at least one location. Get some, you know, little souvenirs, and then we can. Come back. Get back to the games. games. (laughs) Got it. All right. All right. And then, Mandy, you just got back from board game base camp. Because after all, the Dice Tower podcast is all about board games. It is. What is board game base camp? So it's something I go to annually. It takes place, well, around now, so beginning in January. And it's a nice mix of Canadians, Americans, whoever can make it. It's just for a weekend. So it's literally like one big sleepover at a camp. So we're in some rooms have bunk beds um, or you're sharing rooms with other people. And I was lucky enough to share a room with a lot of my close friends uh, that in the gaming community, Nicole, Carol, Peony. So thanks for being great roomies and literally play games all day, all night. I think my last night I was up till four, four thirty in the morning. <laughs> it's now become a ritual to play an exit game at two o'clock <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, it went very well, by the way, I had a great group, very exciting. So 
Yeah. Uh, so Daryl Andrews is uh, in charge of putting it on. And usually we have um, Eli comes, but he's away this year. So Charles uh, stepped in to, to help. So they were great. Everyone was great at the... I don't know who Eli or Charles is. So their last names are escaping me at the moment. And I don't know how uh, comfortable they are with me putting their names fair enough. online. Yeah. So, but uh, they're usually... Just, I just need their credit card numbers and their so- the last four digits of their social security number. Right. <laughs> I know. So no I, just, big. I just give first names just in case they may not, they may not be comfortable with that, but um, overall great time. Super excited for next year. Hopefully they'll make it longer. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Is it? And I, it just sounds like camp. Like, no, it literally is. Camp. It literally is like, it is literally like camp. I can't even, yeah, there's bunk beds and fun stuff and food and drinks like, you know, pops and hot chocolate and all that good stuff. That's yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Live the dream. Oh, my goodness. Well, Mandy, you and I had been talking about how we used to have a Kickstarter segment where we kind of covered on campaigns. And we, you know, we we felt mixed about it. It got mixed feedback. And you and I felt mixed about doing it. But looking at Kickstarter right now, I know that you were looking at a couple of campaigns that you were kind of excited about. And I was looking. So, I don't know. Did you want to just mention a couple of the campaigns? We don't have to go into detail, but... For sure. You never so, know. If people are downloading the show right after it releases, they might want to take a looky look. I haven't been on Kickstarter for quite some time. Uh, I've done a few video <laughs> previews and that's as far as it goes because, well, you spend your money. So I said, why not? Beginning of the year, let's check it out. And of course, I found a few things that, well, caught my eye. So the first one was Railways of Portugal. Uh, I think this is uh, Vital Lacerda. And I think Ian O'Toole did the art on this one. Ooh, so, yeah, so this is attention. an expansion. Because I think there's a set of, I'm not sure. 100% familiar, but I was like, ooh, this caught my eye. And Railways of Nippon, I guess, was another one. It actually is a base game that you can play this with. Um, and then they have the base. Uh, do you remember the name? It's Railways, just Railways of... Railways of the World. Of the yeah. World, that's it. So that's yeah. the one that's the base one that everyone remember. So it's a, you know, it's a trade type game. And, I, I, you know, it could be like anything. But I was just looking at it. I said, oh, this is interesting. And I mean, of course, Portugal. I, I have to kind of check that out. So... It definitely seems interesting to me. And a lot of people have viewed it positively, like that whole series in general. So I'm like, oh, maybe I can foray into it now that they have an expansion that caught my eye. So I think it ends on June 20th. So if you are looking at it, I think it's uh, 12 days uh, if you want to get more details. Uh, and by June, I'm going to assume you meant January. What did I say? You said June. And I mean, oh my, my six-month campaign would be okay. the longest I've ever heard of. <laughs> okay. January 20th. Oh, my goodness. I swear I thought I said January. Wow. You know you're tired when. <laughs> Well, and to be fair, we are recording this at midnight, your time. So I think we'll give you a little bit of, of leeway on okay, that one. Okay, yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, I couldn't I couldn't go without mentioning Stonehenge and the Sun from Itten Games. Itten is this wonderful publisher out of Japan that does really creative, out-of-the-box style games that are virtually works of art. And the one that we finally got kind of published on a broader scale is Tokyo Highway, which is a wonderful... Um, I don't want to call it a dexterity game. It's really about open pathing and it's very puzzly and clever. And that got picked up by Asmodee, which is wonderful. But Stonehenge of the Sun is a new game and you're literally using blocks on this disc and you put them up and then there is this metal ball (laughs) that's like, it's like an inch in diameter or something like that. It's not a huge one. And it swings and you try to, you have to swing it between the different pillars of Stonehenge as you're putting it up and this it, it, it's a very simple concept but placement of these stones as the ring fills up actually gets pretty tricky and pretty clever and you're kind of space recognizing how much space you have and then the physics of that weighted ball is it actually is quite interesting and intriguing and it's so innovative it's definitely different and you can get their other games that are fabulous like Punkatsu mm-hmm. Factory which is one of my favorite little word games um and uh, Tribe, which is a fabulous, beautiful de- uh, dexterity game. You can get that through the campaign as well. So I encourage people to check, take a look at Stonehenge on the Sun. It's unique for sure. Is it going to be for everybody? No, but it's it, it definitely deserves at least a peak. And that is ending January oh, 19th. All right. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Check that one out. So this was also on my list. It looks really interesting. And yes, you're right. It won't be for everybody. But I'm like, oh, it looks kind of fun. So and the pieces look sturdy. So you definitely know you'll get some good oh, yeah. use out of it. Yeah, it's a beautiful production. So the next game on my list is Dicetopia. 
So on the on Kickstarter, it's Dystopia, but the also the expansion called Roll with the Punches. So it's like a strategic kind of board game, and it's not a long playing game. I think it plays in like 20 to 30 minutes, uh, but it has dice manipulation, worker placement, and secret objectives. So I was like, ooh, that sounds interesting. So I had tried to seek this out at Essen, and I think by the time I got there, it had been, uh, it was sold out. I just wanted to check it out and try it out. I don't know what it is about this game that I'm interested in trying. I don't know if the colors are drawing me in, if the idea of the game is drawing me in, but I just need to try it at least. And I see that it's on Kickstarter with this new expansion. So I'm like, is this a sign? Should I back it and try it? This is now the second opportunity. I don't know. What do you think, Suzanne? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I've seen pictures of it when it was originally on Kickstarter. I covered it on my Kickstarter segment on Board Game Breakfast. I think it looks really cool. I I did not back it, and I'm tempted. Yeah, see, I don't know. I kind of wish you hadn't told me about this one. Oh, Darn yes. it, Mandy, I'm trying to save money. Sorry. <laughs> so that ends January 30th, so we have some time, a little bit of time. All right. The last one I would just wanted to mention is Folded Space. This is a uh, insert, a board game insert company, and they've got a campaign going for their, I, I don't know what material it's made of. It's kind of like a cardboard material, but it's like super thick. But it means it's also super light. Mm. And that's one of my challenges with board game inserts sometimes is that they can be very heavy. Now, there are wonderful form, foam core ones that you can buy by Rob Searing that are great. I've got a number of those. And I found I really like the lighter weight ones. Of course, Broken Token, those beautiful wood crates are great as well. But if you're looking for something different to try, Folded Space has inserts for a ton of games. And and for some games that maybe might not have inserts through other companies like Pulsar 2049 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I do know that they take a little bit more work because you have to glue them together. Like Broken Tokens just stick together. And of course, uh, the foam cores from uh, Rob Searing are come pre-assembled. But... I think the trade-off of price, because they're fairly affordable, and weight may be worth it for some people, especially with the selection of games they have. So I wanted to kind of flag that uh, if you're into board game inserts, Folded Space might be something people want to check out. Oh, yeah, I hadn't heard about that one, so I'll take a peek myself. Yeah, and that ends January 15th, so pretty soon from now. So if you're interested, you should take a peek soon. Mm-hmm. But that's enough about games that you can get, or inserts and accessories that you can get. I think we should talk about all the cool games that we have been playing. All right, so let's chat about some games. <laughs> First game, I know, right? I feel like I had all to do right. the games, all like the games, it. and that like cheesy voice, but. <laughs> The first game I'm going to talk about, is it Pipe Mats? Pipe Mats. I, I Pipe Mats. Pipe Mats. Mats. Okay. So it's uh, in English, I think, I believe it's uh, Little Songbirds. And it's designed by Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. Artist is Clemens Franz and Mike Langman. And publisher is Lookout Games. So it's uh, $17 Canadian and $15 US. Now, just as a reminder, these prices are taken from Board Game Bliss, which is a Canadian website, and Cool Stuff Inc., which is an American website that sells games. The game plays uh, two to four players in about 20 to 40 minutes. So in Pete Mats, you play bird cards from your hand and you're collecting seeds and birds at the bird feeder. Sounds simple enough, right? So the seeds and pairs of birds in your collection are worth points. So you want to try and get matching birds together. So same colored card, same valued card, having a male and female bird. Um, <laughs> so that's where I thought it ended. But no, you also need to have majority of types of birds to get scoring of little eggs on the cards. And this is a kind of separate part of the scoring. Oh my goodness. I completely forgot about that when we were playing. So, Oh yeah. Don't get me started on that. I mean, I didn't do badly, but yes, that that's important. So in the game, uh, on your turn, you want to play a card. So you're going to select a, a card from your hand and place it um, on the perch. And there's a card that looks like a perch. And depending on the amount of players you have, you'll have two or three spots to place your bird. And then above that are some seed cards that you want to try and get because, hey, they're going to be worth points. Uh, depending on the bird that goes down against, I guess, the bird that's already on the feeder. So it needs to be bigger than can be lower than, but there are different effects. But if it's bigger than, the difference of those, you kind of count up 
where the bird, uh, seed cards are, and you get to take that seed card, and those are points. And you keep doing that until you've resolved all the birds that are on the floor against the bird that's on the perch. So this is where you're going to resolve effects. And then once that's all said and done, you draw new cards and replenish your hand. So if you had played a card that was on the lower end and didn't quite beat out that bird on the perch, uh, you do end up getting to play a card um, that's lower than one that you had out. So you still get to play something. It just may not be... You know, you may not get that bird on the perch that you actually wanted. Uh, The game ends when uh, the cards that uh, fill the seed row runs out. When you can't do that, then you get the same amount of turns. The game's over. So as I said before, scoring, I mean, it's important to pay attention to what you're looking at. The pairs are really important, but it's also important to try and get the most of a certain type of bird. Otherwise, you get a big fat zero if you don't beat other players. I had a lot of fun with this game. I was like, oh, it's about birds. I love birds, first of all. So the theme had me at hello, birds. Definitely great. Super cute. I liked the art. It's compact. That was really big for me. The box is really small. I can take it anywhere. But I liked the smart play of the game. I was trying to think. It reminded me of another game that I played, and it couldn't. I, it wasn't coming to mind. So, Suzanne, if you remember, but there was a game where you're trying to score certain uh not sets but trying to have the biggest amount of a certain type of card and if not everybody else doesn't score but you score if you have the most i don't know the way i can't i can't think of the game that's coming to my Mm -hmm. mind right now but this was done in a really smooth way even though i kind of forgot about it i still was able to score something because you're always having an opportunity to get a variety of cards which is in your favor but what i also liked is that you could see someone had let's say a one blue card with a certain type of bird. And then you had the one you're like, well, that's not going to happen. Do you know what I mean? So you can abandon ship and work on something else. So you weren't stuck. You can just move on to something else. So I like that that was really visible um, for you. So overall played really well, really quick, smooth play. Everybody really enjoyed The theme was great. And that is Pete Matt's love, love, love. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. I, I remember when I first saw this announced and I wanted to get it. And for some reason, I thought it was at this specific booth at Origins. And so I ran over to the booth. I'm like, oh, I need to get this game. Because I think I'd seen somebody online post that they'd gotten it. Right. Well, I'm a total dip because I was at the wrong booth. They had no idea what I was talking about. And nobody had the game there. I was super crushed. So (laughs) I'm glad to... To hear that because I finally got a copy and I just haven't been able to get to the table and I'm I'm envious. You you always beat me, Mandy. Uh, just you always beat just me. the little ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about a game a little bigger in scale called Scorpius Freighter. Mm. Dun dun dun. <laughs> this is a game designed by David Short and Matthew Dunstan, and it's published by AEG. It's got art from a few artists, Victor Corbella, Jay Epperson, and Matt Paquette. And I think it retails for 60 bucks in the U.S. Now, I will say up front that Scorpius Freighter, when I first saw it, I think I saw it at Essen being demoed. And it had a big spacey looking board and it had some plastic ships on it and some cubes on it. And it's called Scorpius Freighter. So I kind of thought it would be a space theme pick up and deliver game. I was like, okay, yeah, this, this is cool. Well, I, I will say up front that Scorpius Freighter is completely not the game I thought it was going to be from appearance's sake, from the cover art and from one of the, you know, my quick shot of it on the board. So I will tell you what it actually is in case you've seen the cover and maybe you make the same false assumptions that I made. In Scorpius Freighter, this is really more of an action selection and resource management game. First of all, you're going to get your own shipboard. Everybody gets their own shipboard. And this is actually a three-ply board because it's double-sided, but it has those nice uh, cutouts for tiles to sit in, which is really nice. And you're going to get your own shipboard. You're going to get a a deck of cards. I say deck, but you're going to get four cards (laughs) that forms your crew. Yeah, a deck of four cards. (laughs) Close enough. Um. But each of these crew sets are unique. So everything's asymmetrical. And there's a number of crews that you can pick from. And you use the crew cards as your action management, so to speak. And then you get this board. And there are three rings, essentially. And there's a ship on each ring. And the ship travels around. And where the ship lands on your turn, that's the action that you get to take. And whether it's um, 
expanding your ship with new equipment that gives you special abilities or getting more cargo spaces so you can collect certain resources, that kind of thing. The way you move this ship and control the action selection is those crew cards. And they kind of sit under your player board a little bit in a little row. And if you're going to use one, you just push it up a little bit. You just nudge it under the board a little bit more so it's a little more hidden. Mm -hmm. And I will say that's one of my less favorite parts of this game. And if you push one card, you move one space on any of the wheels. And if you push two cards, you move two spaces. Ta-da, that's it. But then the strength of the action is determined by the cards that are remaining. Because cards have these little hand icons. And this is a little complex. Like, it, it's hard to explain verbally, I guess. The, the number of, of crew you take, the, the number of hands that you have available is the strength of the action you can. And so you can multiply it and then you determine how, like, this, how deep into the row you can buy, and that kind of thing, or mm-hmm. how many of an action activation you can take. And I just did a cruddy job of explaining that. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. I think I, 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 think I get it. Anyway, hands are strength of the action. Crew pushing is the how far you can go to get to the action that you want to do. So you're really looking, you're planning, okay, how, how many spaces do I think I can go to get to the spot I need? Will that leave me enough hands? Because if I have to use two crew to get there, well, then I won't have enough hands to take the strength of the action that I need. That balancing is actually quite interesting. And thankfully, the way the rings, the actions, the way that they're set around these rings, it is repetitive enough that another opponent moving the ship doesn't completely hose your turn. So you can be like, oh, I've really got to take the cargo load action. I've really got to take it. And then somebody moves that ship and forget about it's over. No, there's usually little ways you can work around that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not too frustrating, which is essentially a way of mitigating the randomness of opponent selection that I thought worked really, really well. So you're going to be going around, you're going to be moving things, taking actions, expanding your ship, picking up resources, and ultimately you're getting these resources so that you can complete contracts or little side deals, and those are going to be worth points. And you play in, I'm trying to remember, now I can't remember what triggers the end game. Oh, the ships have these little circles, and the coolest part of these little ships, they're, they're nice molded minis, mm. and they fit cubes in them oh that's cute so as the ship goes around and it hits the start spot you put a cube in it and when a ship gets a certain number of cubes in it then that triggers end game but those little minis collecting cubes are really it's a charming little component add to the game um and i think when i saw the game in play because it was a ship with cubes i thought oh they're collecting cubes for pick up and deliver but no not really it's actually just kind of a round tracker (laughs) but it's a really cool round tracker So ultimately, Scorpius Fair is really action selection and resource management, collecting resources to get the contracts that you can for points. And that's the kind of, that's, that's all it is. It was very straightforward to play. It, the, the turns are pretty darn quick. I love that action management of the crew selection and the hand strength. I think that there are very distinct strategic directions you can go. First of all, the crew because they're all asymmetrical and they kind of, the crew kind of gives you a strategic direction. Maybe this crew is really all about completing side deals or this crew is all about trying to get medicine resources, that kind of thing. So it kind of gives you a strategic Mm -hmm. direction to go into. And then you can definitely focus on equipment upgrades or completing a lot of side deals or just flooding your ship with resources. I like that there are different paths to victory in this one. Um, I mentioned I thought the card sliding was maybe a little bit fiddly, not my favorite. The board quality is great. The art is fine. It's, it's, I didn't wow me, but I didn't dislike it. It was there and it it served its purpose. Um, But for a 60 minute ish game that had some really interesting choices, fun gameplay, great component quality with that, those boards with the, that you can, I, I think Scorpio. Oh, and the insert is awesome. It has a great molded insert for the game too. So check out Scorpius Freighter. I really, I will say that Scorpius Freighter is a surprise hit for me. It wasn't what I was expecting and I'm really enjoying it. So I had heard, 
uh, that it wasn't bad. Uh, I saw the art. I have it. So I haven't played my copy, unfortunately, but um, not yet. But the art for me, I looked at it and went, uh, OK, I got to tell you, if I saw that, I would like walk away. It just I wasn't I wasn't I don't know if it's if it's matches the game. I don't know if you can if you feel that it matched the game or it's just not my type of art. I'm not saying it's bad art. It's just not my, like something that draws me in necessarily. Um, but I did hear the gameplay had kind of like a fire, um, firefly esque feel to it. Mm, maybe. Like, I, I don't know. That's, I've heard I, that. I, I think, you know, you have different crews and you're going around and, and uh, you're doing side deals, contracts. I gotta say, I don't, I didn't feel like it was a deeply thematic game. It, I was definitely mm. more focused on the mechanisms of it. Um, I like the crew art. It's stylistically, it's not my preferred style, but there was a little bit of spirit to it. You know, I kind of got attached to my quirky little crews. Um, the first time I played, I picked a crew primarily because I liked one of the aliens, Doreen. <laughs> I had to have the deck with Doreen and I love Doreen and I won. So I love her even more. Um, it's like having a yeah, deck named it, Mandy. Seriously. <laughs> <That's> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think the art did not, let me put it this way. The art did not draw me into the game or when I first saw it, I didn't look at it and go, Oh, I want, like I looked at peat mats. I'm like, Oh, look at that beautiful bird art. Right. I want, you know, I wouldn't look at the art of Scorpius for a girl. Oh, look at that beautiful sci-fi art. I want to know more, but um, it doesn't distract in the game. And the gameplay is so fun. I, I don't, I don't even think twice about it. Okay. I, I, I'm, I will try it. I'm, I'm now looking forward to it. Well, maybe I'll teach you on the cruise. If it's on the cruise, I will teach you this game. I, yeah. Okay. We'll play. <laughs> it's a plan. All right, so that was Scorpius Freighter. Well, now we're going to move from fighting things in space, I'm going to go with, to planting some seeds or gathering seeds. So <laughs> the game I'm going to talk about next is Mystical Seeds, and this is designed by Chang Yud, Ku Chun Wei, and Wang Liang. Artist is Lin Chi Feng and Kai Ng. Publisher is Two Plus Games and tai, uh, Taiwan Board Game Design. And that's actually uh, where, uh, who I acquired the game from. Uh, I didn't have a price in Canada or US for this one. So I did uh, find out it was 33 euros. So I don't know the availability here. Please don't get mad at me. I'm sure it's coming soon. I hope. <laughs> So it plays uh, in 30 to 50 minutes and it's for two to four players. So in Mystical Seeds, players are, you're playing botanists and you're, you're conducting research on these mystical seeds and uh, you're collecting seeds and you're kind of grafting them together and uh, basically trying to uh, accomplish these kind of objective cards to get points. So it's a bit of a race, uh, but 10 or more prestige points will trigger the end game and then most points wins from there. So there are several phases. You have your inspiration phase, and this is where you can exchange seeds and replace three seeds with a level one seed and place on your board. So there are different levels of seed and obviously the higher level of seed are going to get you a bit more bonuses, but you also have potions you could use. And this will allow you to perform what they call garden fairy actions, which are duplicating upgrade and grafting. So duplicating is exactly how it sounds. Duplicate a seed that you have upgrading, basically taking you from a level one to a level two and then grafting. And this is how you're creating higher, better quality type seeds. In the action phase, this is where you're collecting seeds and conducting an experiment. So you select one of the garden fairies and you kind of put it to the side. So these fairies are kind of in front of the different types of seed. And by you laying that fairy, you're saying, oh, I'm going to take this action, but I'm also going to take these seeds from that area. And at the end of the turn, you're going to move the fairy somewhere else. You want to kind of have fairies together because it just means you're going to get more seeds versus if it's by itself, you get one seed. If it's with another fairy, you get two seeds. So having them together is better can also cultivate a plant. So this is where we have some plant cards that are laid out. And it's almost cards that they're kind of like an objective card. So it basically has a listing of the different types of seeds uh, that you can trade in to get this card. And they're worth one or two points generally. And then by acquiring this, then you get to uh, advance on what they call the knowledge track based on uh, based on the seeds that were provided on that card. And the knowledge track can get you other bonuses that you can use in the game to kind of help better the seeds you get or ha help graft better, duplicate better, whatever the case may be. So the game ends as soon as someone has reached or exceeded the 10 points. And then, as I said before, most points wins. 
So the art on this game is a little unusual. I don't dislike it, but at first I was like, okay, that's interesting. It has a fairy and kind of a scientisty wizard looking person on the cover. So I wasn't sure where that was going thematically. I mean, I see it in the way that the board is and the way that the, the components are. And you definitely see it there. I don't know if I had a lot of tie to it necessarily, but you definitely can see that they were talking about plants and that kind of fairy-esque aspect to it. The first time I played this, I played with two players. I didn't love it with two. I mm -hmm. found with two, the person who followed always got a little, what's the word I'm looking for? They got a little hosed, you know? So I felt like I had to be nice at one point point. say, okay, well, I won't move all the fairies out. So you get one thing versus me getting all the things. Do you know what I mean? I just felt like by me going first and moving like that, the person who's coming after me didn't get as good things and then I feel like I had a bit of an advantage so I felt like I had to be nice to kind of even it out a little bit and well <laughs> you shouldn't feel like you have to be nice although it was with Ashley who by the way was not so nice in in uh, Cupcake Empire so now I don't feel so bad about it <laughs> totally kidding Ashley if you're listening <laughs> um, and then I played again with a larger group uh, and definitely had a bit more uh interaction i guess you could say with it but even then we still feel like i think we played with four and even at four we still had that same problem but just at a later time and you know what i mean so there would be that one person who always got stuck getting less than everybody else just because of where they fell in the turn order because there isn't a change in first player or anything like that so that was a bit interesting and we were like hmm, we didn't know if that would change with maybe three players or that's just how the game works i did like the concept of you being able to you know upgrade your seeds they had a board and how you placed it really mattered because depending on what it was across like it had to be across from a certain seed and like oh okay then i can trade this color in but if it wasn't the right color then you couldn't do that action and so you had some limitations in how you placed it and i thought that was kind of interesting and that action of uh grafting the seeds to get better ones i thought that was really neat the rule book, now I think this potentially is a translation issue. I, I'm betting, but yeah. But uh, the wording in the book is, oh boy, you need to, uh, it's not terrible. It's just uh, some of the wording can be a little off. So, or off-putting, I guess you can say. So I don't think they meant it in a certain way, but it definitely didn't come across very well. So this is something to keep in mind. Definitely the, the ideas are conveyed and how to play the game is conveyed and you get that. But I would probably venture out to say maybe some other words might be might be more appropriate. Mm. So that's something they may want to review. So overall, I enjoyed it. I don't think it's a love for me because I had some issues with, you know, that kind of one player constantly being left behind and not due to their gameplay, just where their position was in the group. I didn't really care for that. But I did like the concept, you know, of planting the seeds and gathering the seeds and changing the seeds. And I liked that idea. And I, and, I mean, it wasn't a very long game. 10, 10 points, it's not a lot. If you got the cards quickly, you know, be done in about an hour or so. So overall, a group liked it. I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, Mystical Seeds. I thought it, it was good. It wasn't a love, but it was it was a like. And, and this is one that has that really, it has some really nice components, though, with the seeds and the and the tray, right? That's, I feel, this is one that has a little constructed tray. Yes, I feel like they did put a lot of effort into the tray, Mm -hmm. but then kind of forgot about a few other things. So it's like they put the money in the tray. I mean, the components of the, like the board stuff was pretty thick, but like the fairies mm -hmm. were like very thin and they were really hard actually to get into those stands. Like things like that got forgotten, but then other pieces were really great. Like the potions and the seeds and things like that. A hundred percent. All right. Well, I guess thematically we could, I want to talk about a game about grass. <laughs> <laughs> oh no best segue ever <laughs> no i think it's actually worse than mine <laughs> i'm working on it i'm working on it yeah segues are not my skills yeah apparently um, not mine either <laughs> here let's just do it this way i'm gonna talk about spring meadow now oh okay that works <laughs> sure is that better there we go yeah <laughs> so spring meadow is the third in uve rosenberg's little polyomino series um, with Cottage Garden and Indian Summer. And this one features art by Andrea Bookoff, and it's published by Spielwise and in North America by Stronghold Games. And it, it retails in the U.S. for $60. I am a big polyomino fan in general. I am a big Uwe Rosenberg fan in general. And it's been interesting to kind of go on this journey through this series 
uh, through these designs. Now, Patchwork is not technically part of this series, but of course, it's a polyomino game as well, tile laying game. And I love Patchwork, but of course, it's two player only. So then Cottage Garden comes out and I enjoyed Cottage Garden and it had a lot of charm to it. I liked the theme. Um, but, you know, the more I played it, I kind of was like, OK, I, it, it's OK for me. And then I liked Indian Summer a little bit better because I think I felt it was more complex. Mm. But then arguably it got maybe, I don't know, I like like between the different elements of going for the animal tiles or the, the seeds and all this other stuff. Is it one that I would pull out? when I have games like Ariel now or things like that, I'm not so sure, to be honest. I still like Indian Summer. I still like Cottage Garden, and I would play them pretty much any time. But now there's Spring Meadow. And I will say Spring Meadow is, to me, the simplest and most streamlined of this series. You have tile drafting, I guess, tile selection, tile drafting, I guess, um, similar to Cottage Garden, where you have a big board, it's a grid, a five by five grid, and you randomly put out pieces on that grid. And then there's a marker that moves around the board. And on your turn, you can pick any of the tiles in the row that the marker is next to, row or column. One of the things I really like about this is that the board is marked. You can really look ahead and know, okay, I'm always whatever threes, I'm always in the third, whatever rows that are marked three, those are the tiles that I will eventually have available to me. Of course, if somebody else doesn't take it first, but it gives you a sense of what you can plan for and prepare for. I really like that element. You take a tile off the board and you put it on your own personal player board. Unlike other games, you have to work from the bottom up on this one. And I think it's um, representing the spread of spring. The board looks like it's snowy with just a little strip of grass on the bottom. But as you're putting these grassy looking tiles up, Spring is spreading. Your spring meadow is growing. Um, and so you go from the bottom up in a Tetris-like style. There are little holes on the board that look like holes. They're like little burrows. And then like Indian Summer, there are holes in these tiles. And if you get a, a tile hole over a board hole, you've uncovered a burrow. There's a lot of hole covering. I was going to say, there so, are a lot of holes. <laughs> yeah. And I think... I can't remember what marmot. I can't remember what animal comes out of the hole. And later those will count because you will score points based on the burrows that you manage to uncover. You're going to go around the board and when a certain number of tiles are removed from the draft board, then you have a scoring round. You go through three scoring rounds and ultimately you're actually scoring completed lines, completed rows on your personal board. So it's not enough to plan really smartly and fill in eventually. You've got to fill in from the bottom up. You've really got to complete rows for score. And, and that is simple. It's super duper simple. I've played it with my 10 year old and totally got it, totally played it perfectly well. No big deal. Um, and I've played it with, of course, my game group. And I got to say, I really like hands down. Spring Meadow is my favorite of this series. I like that it's simple. I like that it's streamlined. I, the shapes, one of the things I noticed with, um, a couple of my friends, the shapes are more diverse. They're more complex which makes them more difficult, but also more interesting to use. And I think that was intentional. Um, I, I have also played this like a dozen times solo. Uh, now, not all of y'all are solo gamers, and that's cool, but I am. And this is one where you just plop the board down, pick out random tiles, lay them out the board, and then play the game. And it's that simple. And so it's one of those ones I put it down and I play it like three times in a row because why not? It's that easy to do and it's that quick. So if you like polyamide tiling, if you like that puzzly, how do I make things fit? And you just want a simple kind of light gameplay experience. I highly recommend, I really like Spring Meadow. I think it's a, a real winner. Um, it just hits a lot of right marks for me that that I think, you know, there's things like Feast for Odin, right? Which gets super complex and super heavy. If you want the opposite end of the spectrum, but still get pretty shapes to play with, I think Spring Meadow is a game you should look at. Yeah, definitely one. It's on uh, my list. It's on the pile to play. Uh, I know I played Cottage Garden, which for me uh, wasn't my favorite. I just found it a bit long. And uh, Indian Summer I liked, which is something we'll probably talk about on the show at some point. I just haven't had a chance to get one more play in. And uh, yeah, Spring Meadow. Looks really great. And now that I'm really excited to hear, to play it after hearing what you said. 
So the next game that I'm going to talk about is Mercado. And this is designed by Rudiger, Rudiger Dorn. And the artist is Fiore GmbH. Publisher is Cosmos. It retails for $37 Canadian and $30 US. So in Mercado, you have... Um, these tiles, I guess you're playing, I don't know if you're playing a merchant, but that's what it looks like of some sort. But um, you have these different kind of market stalls and they're laid out um, as tiles on the table. And uh, each player has a bag uh, with, I was going to say marbles, but it has a bag with these kind of clear, I don't want to say tokens, but these clear marble looking type tokens. Let's go with that. Uh, that you're going to use as almost kind of like a payment to, to ward one of these tiles in order to get its benefits. Uh, so on a turn, you're going to draw I guess they call them coins, but you're going to draw them out of the bag and they're different colors. They have turquoise, brown, white, gold, um, and then the black ones. And the black ones are not so good. You don't want these. They're kind of like your bag clog. And when you pull those, it kind of lessens your opportunity to kind of meet the objectives of some of the tiles on uh, on the table. So by completing these objectives you're it is allowing you to kind of move around the board and you're trying to be the first player to kind of get around the board before everybody else in order to win so it is a bit of a race and within the board there are some you know you can flip on the other i think it's a more difficult side there are some spaces that kind of give you bad things but also can give other players bad things as well like more of those black tokens or coins to put in their bag uh so yeah so the game ends when first player to kind of go around the board before and everyone else wins so <sighs> I don't know what to say about Mercado. This one, I, I think I was expecting something a little different. It plays really fast. I've played it with two player. I've played it with three player. I've played it with full player account. And it definitely plays quite quickly. It's one of those games where I think if you wanted to play it at lunch, like, oh, with some colleagues or maybe people who were not into really heavy games, they might enjoy it. But it is super, super simple, super, super fast. Not a great traveling because it's a it's a big box. So it's not something that you're going to want to travel with. For me, it's just one of those games that kind of left me going, I would like to have a little more, please. You know, I just, even though it was a light game, it's like, for example, Pete Matz that I talked about earlier. That's not a super difficult game or super heavy game. It's cards. And it was great. This one had a lot of fancy stuff in it. You know, ooh, this is great. And I just felt like, okay, that's really nice, but it's distracting me from now. Okay, so what is the actual heart of the matter? It's not a bad game. I just don't think it's a game for me, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So I just think it was just a little too easy, if that mm -hmm. works. I don't know. I just didn't feel enough of a challenge. So even if it was like a mid-game, like as a palate cleanser, so to speak, I still don't think it's something for me that I would want to play a lot of. If someone brought it to the table... And uh, or if I had a new group and I, you know, I said, hey, you know, you're you're new to gaming or you want something a bit light. I could definitely play this. I don't know if it would be my first go to, but I could definitely see a people introducing it that way. I just didn't feel there was enough there for me. It just got a little monotonous after a few times of playing. I'm like, OK, let's we're done. It should have been done five minutes ago. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to be honest, but it's very pretty looking. I mean, I do like a lot of the components in the game. That's well done. Uh, the art, you know, it's it's art and theme i mean do i think i'm this person in the game i you know it looks like it'd be a merchant no, of some sort no. no it's not there is a bit of a disconnect but hey there's a lot of games that that happens but you can still enjoy it so for me mercado wasn't for me but i could definitely see the audience that would like it and i definitely think it's someone who does like a lighter game or even maybe some of those people who are new to gaming and you're trying to introduce them in slowly with something light sure so that's mercado so i've played mercado mm -hmm. and one of the things, maybe I missed it while I was thinking about Spring Meadows, but um, the coins that you use, the gold and silver are quite similar in color. Yes. That made it challenging. So that was a small component issue that uh, frustrated me a little bit during um, our play. And uh, just first impressions wise, I agree with a lot of the things you say. We found the randomness of the tiles a little bit frustrating. Right. Even though they tried to balance it by having multiple out. So and then there's those two people at the top that you can always go to that kind right. of thing. But uh, didn't love that. But what we ended up doing after we played agree. It's very simple. It's not a it wasn't like a bad game experience. But no. what we were ended up talking about is we would have enjoyed it more with a different theme. And you just mentioned like it's not a thematic game. You're not. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm the person doing these exchanges, but we completely mentally rethemed the game <laughs> to a video game theme and we liked it better. And it also 
age, like when you think about it, it's so simple. You could play with younger players, but would younger players be drawn to Renaissance era right. jewelry and austere looking people? Granted, the art quality is very nice, but right. they're still austere Europeans, right? Um, but what if... Instead, you had power-up items instead of the jewelry. And instead of them um, just being random treasures you gain, what if they were bosses that you were fighting? And you can imagine there are MOBAs and things like that where you're kind of teaming up against an enemy, but one person gets the kill. And then, you know, another person, whoever comes in second, gets a few extra points, you know, some, some pity points or whatever. <laughs> and so you could be... You know, putting out your tokens as battle chips against your 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 video game bosses that you're fighting. You can get power ups through the other layer, and then the top layer could be like the shops that you go to to upgrade your equipment or things like that. Like it, it would totally work with a video game theme, and I think it would put it into a a perceived complexity bracket, right? That would fit it better. Right. From just a mechanism and complexity perception match. So I hear what you're saying on Mercado. I want Merc- <laughs> I want Mercado rethemed as a video game. I, I know that might sound odd, but I love Rudiger Dorn's designs in general. And um, I, I don't know if Rudiger Dorn would design a video <laughs> game themed board game, though. You never, Alas. You never know. It could happen. And something else to note, the, um, I don't know if it's scrolls or those little tokens that you can get that kind of give mm-hmm. you abilities or give you extra bonuses. Yep. I had such an accumulation of those things. I was like, okay, do I even want them at one point? It was just so many. But now that's, I found that happened a lot when I was playing with two players. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in our higher player count, it wasn't, we were getting them and using them. So. Yeah. All right, Mercado. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> All righty, I will wrap up our games played with a discussion of Treasure Island. Mm-hmm. Designed by Mark Paquin, uh, art by Vincent Dutre. And it's published by Madigo. And in Asia, it's published by Mandu Games, which I want to mention because Mandu Games has really good taste. Like, Mandu Games is kind of a cool publisher. I really like this publisher art creation. Yeah, no, they got some good stuff. And it retails for 60 bucks. And I think it's interesting because all three games I've talked about this week are $60 games. And it's interesting how same price point, when you look at the components or the gameplay complexity, it's just an interesting thing to look at. Anyway, Treasure Island is gorgeous. And this, and it has really creative components. This is actually kind of a deduction game. And in it, one player plays the infamous Long John Silver. And the other players are different characters from the mythos that um, are searching for Long John Sil- Silver Treasure. So basically, Long John is buried as treasure and then eventually gets captured and put into jail. And he's giving you hints to his treasure for some reason. And then he escapes and rushes for the treasure too. So it's not 1v many. Mm-hmm. It's fully competitive because whoever gets to the treasure first wins including the player who buried it, Long John Silver. So Long John, everybody gets, there's a big map board. And then everybody has a player shield and they get a little mini map of their own behind their shield and dry erase pens. There are compasses. Like there's this massive wooden compass with a suction cup that you stick right on the board (laughs) and you use the compass arm. There are little dial, all there's all sorts of plastic templates and all this other stuff. You all are missing, by the way, all the, you know, the arms and the... <laughs> There's a lot of arm waving. A lot, a lot of gesturing. <laughs> um, and Long John will mark where they bury the treasure. And then players have turns down this track of some actions. You can move or you can search. And you use, if you search, you use these circle templates that they have. And it's all dry erase. The board is shiny and it's dry erase. So you, each player has their own colored pen. You put the template down, you draw a circle, and then you go... You know, you search and then Long John lets you know through a little treasure token, did you find the treasure or not? No. Nope. Okay. Next player's turn. But now everybody knows that the treasure's not in that location. The next player can move. You There's little hints that are given like, oh, it's not in this board region or it's a certain distance away from mountains or whatever. And then every once in a while, Long John has to give clues. Long John eventually gets bluff tokens. So maybe the clue Long John gives is true or false. You don't know. And you kind of go on and, and, 
each player actually only gets like three turns, depending on your player count, the way that you go down this track. But because everybody's getting the information as you go, everybody's kind of engaged. And then at some point in the phase of the game, Long John breaks out of prison and has to and is moves to the treasure. And so if Long John gets to the actual treasure first, they win. Of course, now Long John's moving towards the treasure, so that helps narrow it down for all the other players, that kind of thing. Yeah, it is a conundrum of a game for me. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous. The art is stunning. The components are creative. But this is a game in which the art and components get away of the gameplay because that board is fully colored. It's beautiful. Um, and you can't see your pen marks on it very well. And it does matter because there are things that have abilities based on where you last came from and things like that. So you're drawing your movement lines, you're drawing your search circles, all this other stuff. And also the style of dry erase, and I am a dry erase aficionado. I know you know this, Mandy. <laughs> oh, I do. Don't you worry. This is the the type of dry erase that if you just sneeze on it practically, it brushes away. Oh. So, you know, imagine all these people leaning over the board, drawing circles, brushing up. It's, the marks get accidentally erased a lot. The colors can be hard to see on the beautiful art. Um, and, and that actually hinders the gameplay to me, which is disappointing. The fact that every player only gets so many turns, the way that turns are taken, even though you're still collecting information as the inactive player, it still just felt like you... It still just felt like there was downtime for me in between. And the deduction part is a little, it's intricate. It, it is, there are a lot of things like if it is this, you know, it's two miles away from the shore and then it's not within six miles of a volcano. And then there's, it is within six miles of a forest or a lake and it, it, there's just all this complexity. You have to, you're, you're trying to keep track of it. You do get a note card that you can write these things on and stuff like that. But for Long John, when I played Long John, it was certainly a lot to think about. And I had a lot of stress about making sure I was getting them right and not messing up with where I marked it. Um, I've played where Long John's gotten the treasure. I've played where Long John did not get the treasure. Um, but ultimately for me, I've, I think I've played the game enough at this point. Um, I think there are players out there that will love this game. I prefer, and I know this about myself, I prefer my deduction clean. Right. So games like Sleuth, mm. which is a very, very straightforward deduction game. I love it. Or the newly released Cryptid from yes. Osprey Games. Which we haven't talked about. We should. Ooh, mm -hmm. um, I know the guys have a little bit, but I agree because I love, oh, spoiler alert. I love Cryptid. <laughs> as a deduction game. Okay, we talked about Cryptid. Okay, done. <laughs> Treasure Island is a beautiful package. It is creative. It, it does have some intriguing, puzzly deduction that I think some people will really enjoy. But for me, I enjoyed my plays of it to a certain degree. It didn't wow me. I think some of the component frustrations got in the way for me so I've, I've gotten my plays of it um and i'm good okay it, would you say it's like an experience like you've had the experience it was fun and we don't need to do this experience again i am glad i played it i will say that and right. I, I will say i enjoyed playing with my friends but i like my friends and we have fun playing games together that kind of thing i'm glad i tried it i do think they did some really creative things i absolutely so if you are into games that do unique things or do things in a creative manner, it's definitely worth at least to try. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. Something, I don't know if it's in my wheelhouse of games, but I've seen people play it. Everyone looks like they're having a great time. I know a lot of my friends like it, uh, but I agree with you. A, a deduction for me, I, I do like a clean deduction game. And before I forget, the game that I was trying to remember when I was talking about Pete Matt's, it's Parade. Oh, I love Parade. I love Parade, but Parade is the one at the end where you do the whole points, you mm -hmm. know? Yep. Yeah, so that's the one I could remember, but and that's also a great <laughs> game. So there you go. <laughs> and I just talked about Treasure Island, and now we're going to go to the digital side. Let your fingers do the walking in. Tap that app. 
Well, I feel like it's been a while since we've done an app. Maybe it hasn't. I don't know. This foray into the Android world has been fabulous, but I haven't had a chance to purchase any new apps. I've been so busy, but I did acquire one, Indian Summer. So this is designed by Uwe Rosenberg. Artist is Andrea Bokoff, and the publisher is Edition Spielweis. So this was also done by Digitized. So as far as I'm aware, it is available uh, for Android as well as for iPhone. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that, Suzanne. I know this is your... You got it. You're cruising. Perfect. Area of expertise. So for those who are not familiar with Indian Summer, Suzanne had talked a little bit about Spring Meadow. Uh, It's in that kind of world with Cottage Garden where you have those kind of Tetris-like pieces. And in this game, you're trying to basically... Uh, the pieces have holes on them and you're going to put them over marks on the board. And these are going to give you, uh, allow you to put tokens on the board. And this is a good thing because you get to collect these token when a certain section of this board is completely filled in. It's kind of separated off in different sections. Tokens are good because they give you special abilities. Something else that's important to note is grouping of tiles in the game that match animal pieces will also get you extra tokens. So you have these kind of a, illustrations of animals and you're trying to make that happen with the pieces you place on your board and then this gives you those extra tokens that you can use so i don't remember how long the game plays and how many rounds i've been playing it on my app but i'm like been playing the same game for a while now (laughs) yeah it just fills in in, until uh, somebody manages to fill their board right i think that's what it is yes if i'm not mistaken so it's much like the others uh so if you're familiar, I think uh, I, we had talked about Cottage Garden. I think it was me, actually. Uh, it follows a very similar pathway of the setup and how it looks. So, you know, the opening menu is fine. You have some options, casual game, you know, if you want to play against yourself or with friends, that sort of thing. And that's very clear. Uh, there is um, there are you know areas for rules and stuff, but it's a bit different in the fact that it kind of walks you through it. I like it, but I do find in these types of apps. Now, I play on my phone a lot. Now, especially because of my switch from Android, from iPhone to Android, I now have to get either decide if I'm putting it on the iPad or if I'm putting it on my phone. Mm -hmm. So in this case, and it was much the same with Cottage Garden, it's very pretty. The colors are vibrant. And um, unfortunately, I don't have it prepared. I was all ready to share with you the lovely sound it makes when you play it. I think we were (laughs) Do you remember? The bird sound? Yes. And there's like a like cardinal on it. It opens. I'm like, it's my... There it is. And that literally sounds like my backyard. So that to me was like, bonus. I love that. So, oh, yeah. There's the crow or blue jay. One of the two. <laughs> anyway, long story short, I, I love that background. I usually play with my games on silent, but that I was like, oh, I kind of like that. Reminds me of home. But the art and the colors are very vibrant in the game. I really enjoy that. I mean, the, the buttons on the side, it's, it's fairly easy to figure it out. I do find sometimes throughout the tutorials and stuff, it's hard to see Especially, well, sure, on a phone. Yeah, I can yeah, see Yeah, so normally I, maybe it might be better on an iPad, but even then I think on my iPad, I just found it really busy. And so there's no way, like there just needs to be a bit more contrast between that person kind of helping you out on screen versus the actual game. A bonus is that you get to see the other player's board as well while you're playing. So you're not just seeing right. yours, you're seeing what they're doing as well. So that I really like. So you can say, ooh, okay, I know what I'm going to do next turn. So that was a bonus. So overall, I mean, I enjoy the game. And well, like I said, we'll talk about that another time. But I thought the app was fairly well done. Um, I'm not crazy about Cottage Garden, and I actually play the app quite a bit because I like the way it looks. So that's uh, Indian Summer. That that is right. I I I I will say I think Indian Summer is the prettiest. It's really pretty games with the different colored leaf tiles, and yeah, I just it's so pretty as you fill up your board. And I love the music. Well, or not the music, but the background noises until the crow gets a little angry. Until the crow gets a little (laughs) sassy. Well, uh, going away from the forest floor and into a bull market. Oh, God, I'm so bad I at tried, segways. I try not to baby. groan, but it just Andy's came out me so dear. Eye rolls. I know I'm bad at segways. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for not hanging up on me right now. Uh, I have been playing Stockpile. This is a game published by Navu Games, designed by Brett Sobel and Seth Van Orden. And it is, uh, oh my God, it, I just realized it is developed by Digitized, oh. which did Indian Summer as well. And well, you know, there are only so many groups making these apps right now. And so it right. makes sense that there's a little bit of developer overlap. But Stockpile is a stock market game, and it is one of my favorite stock market games in real life because the gameplay is so snappy and it it's streamlined 
and straightforward, but still has enough going on to keep it interesting. You're, it's a stock market game. So they're, they're companies and you're trying to get shares of them. And then the share prices go up and down. So you're trying to sell shares to, when they're up and watch out for when they crash. There are things that change the value, both random effects and then things that you do. Because there's a little bit of an auction mechanism because players will put a card face up into an auction channel and then a card face down into an auction channel. It could be the same one even. So you get these little groupings of cards, columns of cards, and then you bid on them. And it's a kind of auction where once everybody stopped fighting, then everybody just takes the one that they're on. So sometimes everybody will just go, oh, I don't really care. So zero dollars, one dollar, one dollar, oh, we're done. But sometimes there's something really juicy going on. And then all of a sudden it's like six thousand dollars, ten thousand oh. dollars. Uh, you get those cards. They'll have stocks. They'll have negative effects, positive effects, all that other thing. You keep on playing and bam, whoever has the most money then the game wins. Now... I think describing stock market games can come across as very dry to people who aren't right. into that kind of game or into that kind of theme. But Stockpile has never felt dry. It feels very interactive and very engaging to me. It is interesting because of that auction mechanism and because a lot of stock market games have, have you playing the player as much as the game mechanisms? How does that port over into an app? Well, I think overall, the Stockpile app is very, very strong. Um, first of all, there's a lot going on and you have to see all the prices of the market go up and down and you have all these cards, your own cards, other people's cards, market influence, things like that. They do condense it down. They change the the layout compared to the board so that they can get everything on the screen. And I think they made some pretty smart choices and it's pretty, they really rely on the iconography on the cards. And so instead of seeing a whole card, you just see a little circle with an icon and I, that's all you need to know. And I think that that was a smart decision. Um, uh, the AIs seem to function well, but I'm very bad at games. So even though I'm losing <laughs> the AI, that may mean, that still may mean you all crush it, but um and of course, with Digitize, you have asynchronous online play against friends. And that's certainly what I would recommend. It really, the gameplay shines at. Um, because I think with any auction game or any game that heavily relies on the players um, beyond the mechanisms, uh, kind of reading your opponents and bluffing, anything that revile, involves bluffing, I think it's really difficult to do in app form all that said i've enjoyed playing the stockpile game it plays very quickly i enjoy still trying to gauge where the market's going to go up and down and the app has the expansion included so that includes oh. modules that you can add optionally. So there's an advanced board that you can choose from. There are character powers. There are randomized market influencing. So there's bonds. There's all these other little modules that you can pick and choose from. So from a feature and content point of view, this app has a ton in it. So I really enjoy Stockpile. I think it's even better if you have people and friends that you can play against. It doesn't matter what platform you're on. Um, it's a beautiful professional uh, production as usual from Digitize. So I, I, I really like it. I would, I would definitely... I give it my my thumbs up for sure, and that is the stockpile app. I've been I've been playing it. I generally play against the AI, or I don't know. I'm maybe a bit of a recluse. I, I don't like to play online <laughs> with people unless I know you. So, um, yeah. So, it, it, I mean, I like the board game, so I'm really excited to to play it a little bit more. So, there you go. Ah, good choice. All righty, let's go and to everybody. Seemingly, we get so much positive feedback, <laughs> y'all. All we're gonna do is talk. I don't know about our, our less than favorite games if you keep on telling us how much you enjoy it. But um, let's go and talk about some one and dots. Nope. Uh-uh. No way. Never going to play this game again. Wow, that was a one and done. Get in there, you stupid board.
All right. This is uh, seems to be a popular segment, as Susanna spoken about earlier. So for one and done, my choice. Oh, boy. Here it is. Drum roll, please. Way of the Panda. So this is designed by Andrea Mainini, Walter Ober, Obert, and Alberto Vedramini. The artist is David Corsi, and it's published by Simon Limited. So Way the Panda is a worker placement game, and in the game, you're basically controlling three different figures, a monk, merchant, and a warrior. And this happens on the board. Two boards, actually. You've got, actually, no, it happens on a board, and then you have some other little figures that you control on a separate kind of action board. So players choose their actions on this board with their kind of little mini figures, and they use it to build buildings, train their characters, so the bigger character on the big board, to basically to fight, to gain some wisdom, and basically they're trying to build up a city on the board using pagodas and other buildings like that. So on the action board, it's really interesting because you have kind of lines of actions, and then basically your little figures that you're placing, oh, I might decide to put one on an action space. That's great. And I mean, you have to pay a certain amount for doing it, depending how far down uh, you go on these rows, and you can't go backward. So once you've placed it on a space and you're like, oh, I like this space from an earlier row, too bad, so sad. You got to keep going forward. And if someone is going on a space that you were on, they have to add an extra character. So it costs you more as you progress taking these actions. So you may run out of figures, and that's not always a good thing. You want to have as many actions as possible. And the goal is to try and build as many of these kind of pagodas and whatnot on the board in these cities, because that's one of the end game conditions is building a full city. I think it's five, if I'm not mistaken, I might be off on the number. You're also trying to create paths. I think they're like little ninjas on the board. And these paths uh, are basically going to cut once you pay to, for these paths to make these kind of pagodas and buildings, it's going to be easier for you to make the bigger cities in the long run, uh, because you end up that can be a bit of a problem, having too many of these little people in between in order for you to connect your areas because there might be conditions on bonus cards that come up that say, hey, the most connected pagodas or the most connected cities will get you bonus points. And uh, it's really, and some of the cost to do that can be quite high and it leaves you with not a lot of options or actions. So the different characters you have will do different things and obviously allow you to build different types of buildings. So it's really important about where you place it. And it's one of those games where working together can work out for you because you can gain points uh, if people are connected, but then they also might want to try and take over where you are. So my thoughts on the game at first, when we got into it, I was like, okay, yeah, it's, you know, I could see where it's going. The theme for me was a little all over the place. It was like a, it seemed like it wasn't really based on anything historical, so more fantasy. So I don't know if that was the point of it, and that's fine if it was, but it just seemed to be kind of all over. So <laughs> thematically, it didn't really appeal to me. The pandas are cute, but that's as far as it went, if you know what I mean. Uh, the game had no crescendo. I don't know if you know what oh, I mean by that. Do that's you know what I mean? Way to look at it. Hmm. It's like it goes up, and it's like, oh, you're waiting for that big moment in the song, and it just does this. Oh, dear. So <laughs> I just paid all this money to see that opera, and it went flat. So <laughs> I just wow. felt like it was... It was kind of progressing. Okay, the actions. Okay, this is interesting. I like the actions where I might have to pay a little bit more if I want to do that action. Oh, don't go too far down on the board. Otherwise, you won't be able to go back and do that action. And I liked it, but then it felt like much of the same. So you would go there, and then it just kind of plateaued. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing the same things. And all right. And then it started to feel lengthy when we were trying to build these cities, because there's a couple conditions when the game of building these kind of full cities is one way to do it. And it just felt a little long. And I think there was a point where I had, and this is probably poor placement on my part, I had placed my figure kind of, or my, my characters, I had placed them closer to the edge of the board. So they are harder. There are some sure. spaces on the board that are harder to work with. Yep. So if you don't have that connection with anybody, you're kind of like, do, 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 I guess I got to kind of make my way in. But maybe by the time you make your way in, everyone's kind of taken that over. So you're kind of stuck. And I mean, that's where, and this is something that I know I'm not the only person to have said this. Beginning placement is huge in this game. And uh, if you make a mistake like that at the beginning, it's really hard to kind of come back from it. It's mm -hmm. not the end of the world, but it does make it more difficult for you to kind of get in the lead if you, if, you know, if you are in there to, to take it over and win. It just it's, can be difficult. So for me, I just felt it kind of flatlined at a certain point. It didn't really kind of add anything extra to the game. I find sometimes the game, it gets more interesting as you play. This didn't do that for me. Hmm. Um, 
I mean, I did like the fact that they had different thing ways for you to get points. They had bonus cards and, you know, from building the pagodas and other buildings and, you know, trying to reach these cards that gave you extra points. Strength tiles were great. It's another way to score uh, or, you know, double your abilities in the game. So I thought that was really interesting, but not interesting enough for me to say, hey, I want to play this game again and again and again. If you're, you know, into Euro games and you like a very peaceful panda-esque game then maybe you will like it it just it wasn't for me not to say that somebody else will like it this might be right up their alley wasn't for me so that's way of the panda so to be fair i played this game twice because it's called one and done mandy but after the first play i knew i knew but much like another game that i'll leave nameless I had to, I had a friend who wanted to play it. So I had to teach them and sit with them to play it through. And I, you know, I try to give games a fair chance. This wasn't a like, oh my gosh, I can't play it again ever. But I have no intention of playing it in the future. I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm like a negative Nelly this uh, (laughs) time. You can't love them all. And and like you said, they can't, you know, every game is not for every person. So I understand. Yes. There it is. My one and done is also anthropomorphic animals which is okay whatever um and this is moa from ape games it's designed by martin wallace and the art is from vincent joubert and it's kind of car it's card driven action and area control now i will say up front martin wallace for me is really up and down right i adore london so much and i adore steam so much but then there have been some pretty big misses from Mm. martin as well so you know and that's fine that that's totally fine but i i always am curious about every new game because is this the new london or is this the, the new what have you right well the art is gorgeous And the theme was intriguing to me because it felt like there had been some interesting research done into the history of Australia and the native fauna. And there are birds that represent the native population of this island. And then there are mammals that represent the invading forces. And really, theoretically, this is a game about native forces repelling colonial invaders and i thought that that was a really great theme and then it's anthropomorphized with the interesting kind of um, australian animal setting and then that really pretty art i was definitely looking forward to trying this now what i should have known up front was it was area control and that should have been a flag to me because i don't i'm very finicky about my area control and honestly for way of the panda i like way of the panda more than you do I mm. like that action selection board so much and the choices that it drives. The area control piece is the piece I like least in Way of the Panda. And so when I saw Moa, the, the, the card play was interesting to me, but knowing it was driving area control, I maybe should have gone in a little more cautiously. Basically, you have cards, they have different icons on them, and you can use those cards for whatever icons are on it. So maybe it's placing troops out or moving them around or whatever. What, whatever the mix and match icons are. And then each round, two other cards get flipped. And these are the cards that say which zones are active in that turn. And you're going to play cards, put out troops, get majority, score points. You can also uh, sell out. You're you're playing as the birds. You can sell out your fellow bird people to the mammals sometimes for points too. Uh, And then, meanwhile, there's this volcano track, and eventually the volcano is going to blow, and then everybody in the volcano area is going to get smacked down by it. And and because of the nature of the game, maybe the volcano will blow, and maybe it won't. You don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the card play was just not interesting or compelling enough for me to overcome the kind of weak area control mechanisms behind it. And... It just nothing ever felt like it mattered. And I never felt clever for anything that I accomplished on the board, whether I managed to get a reinforcement there or whether I managed to take over a territory there. It all felt more, I won't say it luck. I won't say quite random for the card play out of my hand, 
But where it did feel really random is the cards that flip over that let you know what territories you get to be impacted. Like you have, it, it is completely random. So you can, you got to look at the board and you're like, okay, I'm going to work up in this board. But if that area never flips, like you're building up and you're building up and it never actually activates, that's really disappointing. And you feel like you're throwing effort and because of this random card flip that never happened, you don't get it or you're building up a territory and then the card comes up early. I mean, it almost felt better when you're building up for something and you didn't get enough time to do it. Right. Then if you're building up something, it just never happens. So mm. unfortunately for me, Moa is a pass after one play. I just, the things I liked about it didn't come close enough to overcoming the things I did not care for in it. And uh, that's okay. I still love Martin Wallace. I still will look forward to the next Martin Wallace design. I still enjoy the art. It's still a beautiful game. Uh, Moa is just not for me. All right. And that was one that was on my list, but I have, I've been hearing mixed things. So I might check it out anyway, just to, to see, and we can have a chat about it. Well, I, we can always chat. Of course. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, let's see. It's been a few episodes since we've done some Q&A, so we should probably just answer a couple of questions. Yeah. And then we should let you go to bed and because we got we got boats to get ready for. Darn right. And I got to be rested. No illness here. (laughs) Q&A. So we decided to reach into the mailbag this week and have a little Q&A. It felt like it had been a while. So let's see what uh, Jared has to say. So with the recent resurgence of the roll and write genre, I'd like to know if there are any more vintage ones, say from the 80s or earlier, that you think are still worth playing. What do you think of the venerable Yahtzee and its ilk? Or Sid Saxon's Extra, now being sold as Can't Stop Express. And are there any that have been forgotten, but that you wish hadn't? And a little P.S. Does Farkle count as a roll and write? I would think not, because you're only writing down your scores. So I'm going to throw this over to you, Suze. I feel like this is more in your realm. <laughs> <laughs> the history <laughs> through the ages. Um, roll through the ages. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I will say that it, yeah, we can talk about the cult of the new or the glut of games. And some people look at all the games coming out now as... Um, they can they view it as a concern, as a negative. But what I will say is sometimes games get better okay. as they come out. And the nice thing about new games is that they learn lessons from older games. And I think in the case of roll and write games, I mean, certainly there's plenty out there. But thinking about ones that were published and ones that were worth playing back then. I can't think of a lot of vintage quote unquote ones. Now, can't it stop express or extra is absolutely one that I would have mentioned if, if it hadn't been the question. So I think uh, that is a good example of uh, people digging out a roll and write game um, and, and bringing it back to life that, that has a worthy place on the shelf. I also think uh, Knizia did something called uh, decathlon. That is perfectly playable. You know, it's 10 little things, 10 little games, and it's all very, it's dice-based, and uh, you can make it at home. You can just print it off online, the little rules for it, and give it a try if you want to. And I think that, I think that Decathlon is fine. Now, just, but to be honest, like, I think that there are games that do something similar. Maybe they were even inspired by Decathlon, but I think that they almost do better. What Decathlon does, if you do them all, is it, you know, gives you different, um ways that you're using the dice for the different events kind of thing to some degree. But overall, I got to say that the new influx of roll and write games is appealing because they're good. They're interesting. They're exploring other mechanisms and complementary mechanisms in, in different ways. That is um, really, really exciting. That said, I love Yahtzee. I love Yahtzee, and I would I would attribute my love of roll and write games in part to my old love for Yahtzee. So I will almost always be up for a good old classic game. Oh my gosh! Do you Yahtzee. remember the commercials? Yeah, yeah, Yahtzee. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe that no, was just in I Canada. Don't. Okay, 
that's just you. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree that Farkle is not a roll and write game. If you're just tracking your score, then um, if writing isn't somehow integral uh, to the gameplay itself, I would not categorize it as a roll and write game. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. All righty. Well, Ben also, I think, and you know, thank you all. I know not everybody is into rolling right games. So I really appreciate you all who kind of put up with it and bear with us as we, we talk about it. But there are a lot of people who are into it as I think proven by we are getting questions about them. So Ben asks that given our love uh, for roll and write games and the rise in popularity, they're wondering if there might be potential for a roll and write style legacy game because the medium already lends itself to defacing the board. So why not uh, extend it into a multi-game legacy style format? Can we think of any existing games that might be able to use this format or an existing roll and write game that could work this way? Or am I just barking up? The wrong tree. Do you feel like hmm. this kind of game would have to be longer than your average roll and write to make it not exciting, but to make it worthwhile doing it as a legacy? Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's one of those things that have to be incorporated maybe into a game that's a legacy type game already or that you could see being a legacy type game. I don't know, but I'd be curious to, to get your thought on that, too. Well, I, I don't know about that. What I can tell you is that there's certainly um, some roll and write games that have started to explore this space a little bit. So Spiel Press, uh, which is kind of an offshoot, I believe, with Button Shy Games, who does the little wallet games. They did uh, a couple of games, uh, Star Maps and Blood Royals. And I believe it's Blood Royals that specifically has you leveraging things that you did in earlier games for later games. And they, it's a book and you get different levels of score sheet uh, that it, it, it's all very clearly the same game, but you know, it changes up a little bit as you go. So I think that somebody's uh, you're not barking up the wrong tree. Cause I certainly think it's a space that people are interested in exploring. I actually love the idea of either. I don't know if legacy is the right term here or something more like a campaign where choices you make now impact the game differently later. Now, Mandy, you've played St. Malo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the games that have you counting resources or like drawing a map could be really interesting. I think ones that have you just filling in numbers like uh, 21 or Quinto, which I love both of those, maybe not as interesting potentially as an ongoing thing, but something that has you drawing roads or things like that, or like roll through the ages, there's potential there for sure. If somebody wants to pursue that as a design um, challenge, I would, I'd be in for it. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't, I wonder if it would be, if it would work, well, kind of having that, maybe that is the main thing, but then mixed with something else. You know, you know how these games like, you know what I sure. mean? And I think that can kind of lend itself to having a slightly lengthier game. Not necessarily long, but giving it some substance and length. I don't know. That's just a thought. I think that's a great point. So Sarah is asking here, when introducing games to new gamers, do you try and do all the housekeeping? So like giving out the money and... Round set up, tear down, or try and include the new players. As a host, I feel like I should do all the housekeeping, but part of me thinks I am leaving them out of the game. Oh, that's really interesting. Actually, I never thought about it that way. Oh no, I spread the love and delegate. <laughs> so, if you were thinking about doing it, you are now. I think it's a good way for, during setup for people to get accustomed. Oh, these are the components. Oh, what's this? I think it's a nice way to kind of see what's coming and then tearing it down. As you're doing it, you're having conversation. Oh, that was a great game. Oh, I really like that move you did here. And I always feel like putting away the pieces is almost like a little, you know, you have a little sharing moment with the group about how the game played. You get really excited or you get really angry or some kind of emotion about how you played. So, I mean, I, I try to include everybody in every part of it, but that's not necessarily for everyone. I don't know. What do you think? <sighs> wow. I, I don't know if I've thought about it this way, but I think, Sarah, this was an interesting question because yeah. is, it, is it poor hosting? And it's not. I don't think that. Okay. No, I don't think that. And some people might be appreciative, especially if it's a like, ginormo game. I won't lie. There's been a couple of games where I've done most of the setup because there's a lot. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you're a bad host. You're trying to be a good host by, you know, doing nice things. I think it has to, for me, it would just lean towards efficiency. What's, what gets the game set up and put away fast enough, fast so that we can play another game? And if that's delegation, great. If it's, hey, you're the only person that knows how to set up this game. I'm just going to do it. Then that's fine, too. Um, 
it's, I guess, so for me, I guess it's just contextual, but wow, I never really thought about it. Is it part of the no. hosting decision? But I definitely think that if you're like, oh, no, I'm going to set it up because I'm hosting, it's my house, it's my game or whatever. Well, that's different. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it also depends on the attitude that goes with it as well. But I think if you were hosting and you set it up, and I mean, I know I tend to be, I don't know if you can over host, but I'm usually doing so many things when I host in general. I might be that person, depending on who it is. I don't know. Maybe. But that's a really interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Well, Mandy, I have a question for you. Oh, dear. Because this is our first episode of 2019. Woo! And that's exciting. New year, new games, new adventures to be had. Are there any... Is there anything that you are hoping to accomplish or do in the gaming sphere this year, whether it's a show you want to go to or a game you want to play or some kind of milestone you want to reach. Do you do like some people online do these challenges like the 10 by 10 challenge or the, where you have to play 10 games, 10 times within a year. Is that your thing? Do you ever do anything like that? Or are you just like, I just need to survive. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds about right. Actually, I take it in the other approach in the fact that I need to kind of, I'm super busy and I don't know if people know, like, I mean, Suzanne and I, we, we work full time jobs and they're busy in itself and, you know, life happens. And on top of that, we do the podcast, we do video content, we do lots of things. We're online, social media. So I think this year it's going to be about streamlining, you know, trying to focus on the really, really important, don't get me wrong. Everything's fun and great, but really focus on things that I think are going to benefit everybody. So I know that sounds super vague, but, you know, definitely look at making new and important content, maybe things that are not out there already, whether I do that by myself or with Suzanne or, you know, well, just throwing it out there. Mm. And uh, (laughs) exactly. So I think for me, this year's more streamlining and really trying to get that focus. Doesn't mean I'm going to be ignoring everything, but I have a tendency to have an issue with saying no to a lot of things. Because I want to make everyone happy, you know, and I want to do my best. But um, I think this year's definitely going to be about setting limits and streamlining. I like that. Good for you. Yes. What about you? Uh, I guess I should have prepared an answer. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I hope now 2018 was an amazing year because we got to go to so many conventions oh, yeah. and it was magical, but it was a lot. And as a mother to two young kids, it was a lot of time to be away from them. So I think actually I want to travel less, but maybe do more content. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Amanda Ann oh, Hutchinson. Really? So, <laughs> yeah, I think that we've discussed some things, and who knows? With all the streaming line, maybe we'll find some some additional time. Um, I'd also like to play some heavier games. Oh, I've been playing oh. a lot of medium weight games or lighter games, and I. I'm an Omni gamer. I love games of all types, but I've kind of been feeling a hankering to get a few weightier games. It's just because we, we try to play a lot of different games and sometimes the bigger ones are harder to get to the table. Uh But this year I'd really like to maybe put a little effort into that. And I know I have gaming friends that'll be happy to assist me on that one. So that's, that's my hope for this year. I'll be getting a little ring ring. Hello, Mandy. I'm looking to play a heavy game. What? This is so exciting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we'll see how we do this year. Streamlining, heavy games, new content. 2019, it'll be a good gaming year. What I do know is I've been hearing whispers about the games that are planned for the year mm-hmm. from different publishers, and I'm pretty excited. I think 20, like we just talked about our top 10 of 2018 uh, a few episodes ago. I think 2018 was a great year, and I think... 2019 has a lot of potential from early whispers I'm hearing. So I'm really looking forward to discovering new games this year. All right. I want to hear these whispers. I didn't hear any whispers. I'll I'll, I'll send you a private message later. Okay. Sounds good. Well, everybody, tell us, you know, why don't you send us an email or drop us a note on social media or in our, uh, in our board game geek guild. What are your hopes for your 2019 gaming year? Do you have any goals? Are you setting any challenges? I want to know kind of where your focus is. What are you hoping from or hoping to see from the board gaming world? in 2019. Let us know. You can also email us additional questions. I am Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And I'm Mandy. That's Mandy with an I at Dicetower.com. And with that, I think that we will call this an episode. 
thank you so much for joining us for all of our board gaming chat. It's always fun and always a privilege to be able to talk about all these wonderful games with you. Next episode, episode 589. Tom, oh, we're getting close to episode 600, Mandy. I know. (laughs) Well, 589, Tom and Eric are actually going to be back looking uh, backwards a decade at the best of 2009. And then after that, I think that we're doing a live show on the Dice Tower Cruise with the whole crew. So we will see what kind of shenanigans we can get up there. Absolutely. Until next time, everybody, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Andy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Roy Canaday, Rob Searing, and Jeff Rademacher. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it is that time again, two truths and a lie. So, well, of course, I will start. I like Fallout video games. I like Red Dead Redemption. And I like Mortal Kombat. If you said that the lie was, I like Red Dead Redemption, you would be correct. Oh, my goodness. You know, when you have lives, like scenes of like, skinning animals and stuff I just not for me and that that was happening there now even in Fallout I do like them but I refuse to buy the new one that's a whole other podcast we'll leave that for another time but on a whole I do quite enjoy them (laughs) what about you Suze what about your truths and lies all right from last episode I said I've backed over 360 games on Kickstarter I said nearly 25 of the projects I've backed are overdue or late and I have lost nearly $800 on dead projects. Oh. And the lie is that nearly 25 of those projects are overdue. <laughs> yes. I've actually gotten to a good place where I think under 20 are overdue at this point. Oh. But of those 20, I think like 12 of them are never going to show up. <laughs> that's Unfortunately. That's so much. And I've lost a lot of money on games that <gasps> never went anywhere, unfortunately. Oh, I'm so it's sorry. the risk. That's it's true. It's the risk with crowdfunding, alas. Mm. <sighs> All right. Well, time for some new ones. I will start with. Okay. Oh my gosh. What's I know. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. Um, <laughs> I can break dance. I don't know where that music came from, but sure. To EDM? <laughs> to EDM. Okay. It's a thing, maybe. So I can break dance. I studied ballet and I can tap dance. All right. And new for me this week, I like cherry Coke. I like lime Coke and I like vanilla Coke. All right. So there you have it. Please ignore my terrible musical intro to the new (laughs) two truths and a lie. And good luck, everyone. (laughs) This episode is sponsored by... Play Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Gemstone Mining Game and push your luck as you collect valuable gems from the mine and earn bonus points by discovering gem combinations from Snow White objectives. 
based on the popular Quartz gameplay by Passport Studios. It's for ages 8 and up, it plays 3 to 7 players, and MSRP is $34.95.